Welcome to Lingthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Lauren Gorn. And I'm Gretchen McCulloch. And today, we're getting enthusiastic about how every word is a real word. But first, it's almost our second anniversary! Wow! Yay! Next month is our anniversary month we like celebrating in November. It will be episode number 26. Um, we can do maths, don't worry. It's not episode 24 because we launched with several episodes at once, uh, but we are very excited about our anniversary month. Yes! And on our first anniversary, we celebrated by asking you to help more people find the show. And you definitely came through. We ended up thanking almost 100 people in our anniversary post for all your recommendations on social media, and we saw a big bump in listeners which kept going afterwards and even until now. And so this year, we want to see if we can thank 200 of you for recommending Lingthusiasm to people in your lives. That means we need your help. So if you know anyone who could use a little bit more language nerdery in their lives, this is the month to share the show on social media, email people, text them, send it to your group chat, or just leave a well-placed sticky note for the person in the office. Writing a review or even just leaving a rating on whatever podcast app you use really helps us so much. It helps other people find the show and it helps encourage other people to click play uh, if they happen to come across us. And it helps your friends who need more interesting things to listen to, who want more fun linguistics in their lives. It helps them find something that they're going to enjoy. So if you send us your reviews or tag us in your posts on social media, we would love to see them. And we'll be thanking everybody that we know about in our anniversary blog posts on lingthusiasm.com. And we'll pick a couple of reviews to feature there. If you would prefer to recommend us privately, please send us an email with a story of how you recommended us so we can add you to the thank you post. Or feel free to just recommend us and not tell us about it, and you can still get the warm, fuzzy feeling. Plus, you'll get to feel a warm, fuzzy glow of satisfaction both when you recommend us and when we thank you all together at the end. Even if you don't tell us about it, you can still feel that warm, fuzzy feeling. Enthusiasm is an independent show, but we are lucky to have a massive marketing department, which is all of you. And we really appreciate when you take the opportunity to share Lingthusiasm with other people. If everybody introduced the show to just one new listener, our audience would double. (laughs) So this month, take the chance to recommend us or review us. We really appreciate it, and so do the people who are about to discover the show because of you. We also have another way to discover the show, which is two live shows. In addition to the Melbourne live show, which is going to be on the 16th of November, and we're also added a show in Sydney on the 12th of November. So you can go to either of those shows, just go to lingthusiasm.com and look for the link that says live show to get tickets. We're really excited to be joined by, we're really excited to be joined by Tiger Webb in Sydney, who is the ABC's language researcher and super excited to also be joined by Alice Gaby for our Melbourne show, who's a researcher at Monash. And we're also thrilled that we will have both shows fully Auslan interpreted as well. Yeah. So at the topic of those shows is how the internet is making English better. So we're going to be talking about a few bits that are coming out from my book and from other things on the internet. And if you're texting and emoji and everything, and there's no knowledge of linguistics or of previous Lingthusiasm episodes assumed. So feel free to bring your friends, even if they have never listened to an episode, because then they'll have this whole back catalog to discover. And we're really looking forward to seeing you there and meeting people in real life after the show. Other quick exciting news, we have new merchandise, including adorable Space Babies, t-shirts that say, I want to be the English schwa, it's never stressed. We also have baby clothes that say, not judging your grammar, just acquiring it, as well as new IPA scarf colours and now IPA ties. So you can get the International Phonetic Alphabet on various items, as well as the clever baby riff on not judging your grammar, just analysing it. The baby is just acquiring it. I love this one so much. (laughs) (laughs) And the space babies are so cute. Everything's coming up babies in in the merch these days. Yeah. Including this month's bonus topic, which is about multilingual babies (laughs) and raising a kid speaking multiple languages. So for this and 19 other bonus episodes, there are so many bonus episodes now. It's like twice as much Lingthusiasm. You can go to patreon.com slash Lingthusiasm and support the show and listen to all the bonus episodes. And while everything's coming up, babies, probably about time I let everyone know, I'm going to be having a baby in January. What? 
What a coincidence. It actually really is a coincidence. <laughs> That's actually quite the coincidence that uh, well, it's just it's just baby month uh, here at Lingthusiasm. We are definitely going to keep running all the way through December, January, February, and beyond. So no worries about that. We'll still have our main episode every month, as well as your Patreon bonus episode. Yeah, so we'll be recording episodes in advance and interviews and so on to make sure that we give Lauren some mat leave from the show and make sure that everyone here still gets to listen to it. And I'm very excited to hear the results of your new long-term longitudinal language acquisition project. (laughs) Have you ever heard Lauren someone say, that's not a real word? Oh my gosh, like so often. All the time. It's just a go-to phrase that people throw around a lot. But when we started talking about this idea of what is a real word and what is not, it seems like such a simple throwaway line, but there's so many things that are happening when people say this. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of different things that someone can mean when they say, oh, well, such and such, that's not a real word. And it seems like breaking those down individually can help us understand like what's really going on here and why, spoiler alert, all words are real words. And (laughs) uh, we're going to come back to that. (laughs) Keep coming back to that. We'll keep coming back to this very important point. I don't like to do the fake myth busty thing where it's like, it's an open question. Are there some words that aren't real? Like, no. Absolutely not spoiler alert. (laughs) I'm going to start with the answer and then we get to break it down and not leave you hanging. Yeah. So there's not going to be any surprise. Everything is a real word at the end of this. We're very happy to state that as a starting point. Are some words unreal? It's, I think it's one of those questions that's like, that's like saying like, are some animals not animals? (laughs) Well, you're already calling them animals. Like, (laughs) what are you doing with yourself? Yeah. Are some words not words? No. The thing I find really interesting about the different subcategories of it's not a word is it shows how we conceptualize words and how our brain processes different things in different ways and how language is both this thing that happens in our brains but also in our particular social contexts and interactions. And that's why in this episode we're going to look at all the different things that people really mean when they say that's not a real word. Should we take it to a Gretchen? Okay, let's take a tour. We've given them very serious scientific category names because everything sounds so much better when you give them a very official name. Yeah, the first kind of thing that people mean sometimes is the blobfish. The blobfish reaction. (laughs) The blobfish reaction. So if I'm like, oh yes, here's a blobfish. What what the heck is a blob? Blobfish isn't a real word, Gretchen. You just made that up. You're you're not even sounding sciency by saying this is a blobfish. You're just looking at something that looks hideous and calling it a blobfish. That's not a real word. Like it's a cartoon thing. Uh, blobfish are apparently real animals. I googled strange animals to try to come up with like the best example of a strange animal, uh, and the blobfish won like hands down. It is really weird and blobby looking. You should definitely look it up. But more to the point, apparently blobfish exist. Apparently, the scientific community probably also has a Latin name for them, but definitely also calls them blobfish. And this is something that if you hadn't heard of it, like me half an hour ago, or like Lauren until two minutes ago, you're like. That sounds fake. I just looked it up on Wikipedia, and they are apparently a fish from Australia, so now I'm feeling very like I failed as an Australian. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) But they don't have a name like Blobbo or something? No, we haven't called them Blobbies yet. Uh, I think that's just a failure of imagination. (laughs) Um, But yeah, so (laughs) so sometimes your reaction is, that's not a real word because I don't think that's a real thing. I don't even know if that's a thing, or it's just I haven't heard this word before. I felt really embarrassed because I was like probably about 26 or 27 the first time I heard the word isthmus. Oh, okay. And I just did not have it. It turns out we just don't have isthmuses in Australia. It's like a peninsula type thing. Yeah, it's kind of, I don't know what the difference is between isthmus and a peninsula now that I'm thinking about it. I'm sure someone does. But the difference is that I had heard of the word peninsula before (laughs) I was 27. I mean, I grew up on a peninsula, but I don't know... And there are definitely also some places called ith- isthmuses. Ithmi? Ithmopodes? What is the plural of an isthmus? I, I can't even say this word anymore. It's too difficult. Yeah, trying to have the first reaction of, instead of being, that's not a word, trying to have the first reaction of, that is not a word I have encountered yet. Yes, I haven't heard of that. And how, 
how sad the world would be if I knew all the words already. Like, can you imagine not learning any new words? Like, you'd never have that, like, whoa, what is that? Or I learned a new thing now. Like, imagine a world where you'd learn only words. That's a terrible world. Imagine a world where the vocabulary was so finite that you'd run out of new words and experiences to have. Oh, what a horrible word, world. You know, like, I'm trying to think of examples of this because I've definitely heard of words like far too late and been like, whoa, that's a real thing. Okay. But also think of how quickly your brain managed to absorb them and accept them as I now very happily accept that isthmus is a real word and the isthmus of Oaxaca is a real place uh, because my brain is capable of accepting new words. And that blobfish are real animals, apparently. I saw a graph one that said the average adult between the age of like, I don't know, 18 and 55 or something learns one new word on average every day. So like we're still learning new words all the way through adulthood, even though we think of learning new words as something you do when you're like a kid or when you're in school or when you're acquiring a specific technical area. And yet we're picking up new words all the time. We're perfectly capable of it. So the important lesson here is that we don't know all the words. Erin McKean has a really nice quote about this from her TED Talk about redefining the dictionary. And she says, when people think about a place and they don't find that place on a map, they think there's a problem with the map. But when they find a word that's not in the dictionary, they think this must be a bad word, but it's more likely to be a bad dictionary. And I think that really sums it up. Like, okay, maybe a word is or isn't in a dictionary, but you've still found it. And the dictionary is something that's just made by people and they still have to acquire all the words themselves. As funny how we go, I don't believe you that blobfish is a real word, but it's not like I'm going to sit here and go, I don't believe you that Carlton isn't a real place. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I'm going to take you to Carlton when you're here because there's great ice cream. Okay, good. Yeah, I'm like, oh, Lauren, I haven't been to Carlton. I didn't know there was actually, there's, so there's a Carlton in Canada as well because the Brits and colonies and stuff. <laughs> and it's the name of a university in Ottawa. So I've been to that Carlton. I'm like, that's, that's a real place, but my Carlton is not the same as your Carlton. <laughs> Well, that that is probably true in this case. I think there's kind of a subset of, of this category, which is using an existing word in a different sort of way. So one of the things that I did for my very scientific research of this episode was I looked for the quote, isn't a real word and not a real word, to see what kinds of words people were saying weren't real words. So this is how we came up with these different categories, is we took what people were saying about something not being real words, and we kind of broke them down into the different types of things people do. And a couple that we came across people saying weren't real words were things like learnings, which is, I guess, used in like teacher jargon to mean like the learnings, the out learning outcomes or the like the learnings that the students will derive from this lesson are blah, blah, blah. And I haven't heard learnings being used in that particular context, but I definitely believe that people could do it. And the annoyance that I was seeing with someone calling that not a real word was more about being annoyed with jargon or being annoyed at using an existing word in a different sort of way that the other person wanted to be like, no, that's not legitimate. Like, I don't want to acknowledge that one. And again, it's a, this, like, I have never come across this before, so it must be wrong, not I just haven't had my brain expanded for this new category. Maybe there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than have been dreamt of in your philosophy or your learnings, as it will. It's also very likely, like, you can almost reliably put money on this, but especially the ones that people keep coming back to, like, impact as a noun mm. is one that people complain about a lot. And, like, there's over 200 years of records of people using that word in that way. Generally, these ones become kind of recurrent cycles of outrage when there's no good evidence that other people haven't been happily using it this way for a very long time. Yeah, like... Either it's been used that way for a long time, or it hasn't been, but we could start doing it now. It's it's fine. <laughs> um, people seem to pass along their annoyance with corporations or with their boss or with stuff being kind of new to you and therefore opaque or difficult to understand with the annoyance of the words themselves when they're just, you know, the words are innocent here. They're just channeling your feelings towards the boss or the you know, there's a lot of corporate yeah. jargon going on or something like that, saying, you know, learnings, if people are using it as a word, it's a word now. Uh, and impact has been a useful verb and noun for, you know, many hundreds of years. The next type of that's not a word reaction you find kind of is a, an extension of that form that we just talked about, which is what we're calling the funner reaction. When I came across this one, I specifically saw a lot of people using words like funner and funnest and self-consciously saying of themselves, like, this game is funner than the other one. I know that's not a word. 
So rather than using it as a criticism of someone else, like I noticed with the other kind of examples, people were using it as kind of a preemptive self-criticism of like, yeah, I know this isn't a word, don't, don't make fun of me for this, but it's something that I want to use right now. And I think that's slightly different. It's something you want to use and it makes complete sense. So something like impact as a noun is completely codified in English. There's lots of examples. Things like funner or necessariness or squishable are all words that might not be in a dictionary, but we know what each of the individual parts of that are. We have English morphology that's sufficiently consistent and transparent that we understand what all of those bits are doing when we combine them, even if they're not codified normally to go that way. Yeah, like you can add ible to a whole bunch of words. You can say squishable or huggable Donutable. or laughable. <laughs> donutable. I think a lot more things should be donutable or ice creamable. Yeah. Are the same types of things donutable that are ice creamable? Like, this is great. It's really cool that language can do this. And it's a shame to see people limiting themselves from this or kind of not limiting themselves, but then adding this preemptive fig leaf because we're so used to limiting ourselves by not doing this type of linguistic play. Like, it's there to be played with. Let's play with it. Especially if you are kind of, it's interesting that people feel they have to police themselves on social media, which is a more playful and informal. Like, maybe don't start using non-standard combinations of bits of words in, like, a job application or, you know, your Nobel Prize speech. Maybe stick with some more standard forms there. But if you can't play around with language on social media, it's a bit sad. Yeah, well, and I think, like, the question is not so much, like, where is making up words or where is playing around with words appropriate, but, like, where is play appropriate? And, you know, certain types of environments, like a formal dinner or something, aren't necessarily appropriate for playing with your food or playing with your words, <laughs> but that doesn't mean that other environments aren't appropriate for this, you know? Look, like, I've made my soup play. donutable. <laughs> <laughs> like, maybe don't do this if you're having dinner with the queen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Like maybe, maybe don't. But that's that's a feature of like a particular social situation in a broader social context. And I think we have the sense of like that language should be more rigid than even other areas where, you know, like an experimental chef is admirable. Or like if you're good at experimenting in the kitchen, like that's a good thing you can do. And yet people feel the need to apologize for experimenting with the vocabulary. Like, don't apologize. This is great. This is a feature. It's not a bug. I feel like there are some really expensive restaurants where you pay a lot of money to have ice creamized soup. <laughs> no. It's, it's worth experimenting with this. And some of them are almost so, so well used that they've taken on status of their own. Like, a lot of people will observe, you know, you can be overwhelmed, you can be underwhelmed, but can you be just whelmed? Or why can't you be just whelmed? Like, some of these have been around for a while. Poor whelm. It got abandoned by its cool, more morphologically complex children. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's children abandoned it. But yeah, like, let's, let's play with these things. So whelmed was a word. It was a completely normal yeah. word. And we added under and over, and then we forgot about whelmed. And now people say, you know, whelmed isn't a real word. Poor whelmed. And like, it was real for a while. Why can't, why can't it come back? <laughs> but I think, you know, it's, it's a matter of perception. If people start using whelmed again and, and people will figure out what it means. It's like a horse getting into a unicorn costume and it no longer exists. <laughs> I think another reaction that I see from, okay, is this a word or can this be a word, is what I'd like to call the schadenfreude reaction, which is like, well, the Germans have a word for this. <laughs> <laughs> like, in we English speakers, we can't possibly, but like, the Germans must have a word for it. And this one always is a very particular kind of reaction because it's a sense of like, it'd be great if we could create a word, like, it'd be nice if this type of thing existed, but like... I can't possibly do that as an English speaker. We need to go to another language and let them do it. Which is a lot of kind of like what the history of English speaking science and philosophy have done is just like go to Greek or Latin and make them create a word and then borrow it into English because somehow that seems more legitimate. Like these days it's German, but it's the same sort of thing. And I think it's that we create words in English all the time. And yet we have this sense of like, oh, maybe someone shouldn't do that or this kind of thing. And in particular, German is very good at creating words by compounding them. English is also good at creating words by compounding them. Yeah. It's just that we still leave a space there. 
Yeah, I found someone saying that for some reason they thought apple lovers wasn't a real word, and I was very confused about this because surely all English speakers recognize apple, and surely all English speakers recognize lovers, and so I guess they're asserting that apple lovers together isn't a real word, but like, you just made it, like, congratulations, now it's real. <laughs> but it's got a space there, Gretchen, and I'm very anxious about the fact that a word is a thing that has a space on either side of it. Well, and so maybe this is the point of the podcast where we have to say, like, for all that we're saying all words are real, there's another linguistic sense in which a word isn't even a linguistically meaningful unit, because where you put your spaces is a certain kind of arbitrary. It's as much a product of the history of our writing system as it is anything else. Yeah, and like the same thing that gives German a word like schadenfreude, which is literally just schaden, which means harm or damage, and freude, which means like happiness or joy, and they're like, oh, harm joy. Like English could do this too. English does the same sort of thing by, you know, smushing together multiple words. It's just we're more likely to leave a space there and less likely to like shove them together. Like if you wanted to say apple lover in German, you could definitely do that. Probably be something like Apfelieber, but you just wouldn't put a space there. And oh, so that's it's... great. We should use that in English. <laughs> but we could just say apple lover. So we could accept that having a space in the middle of something doesn't prevent it from being a word. Yeah, and there's lots of, you know, like dictionaries are really good at adding compound words, even if they have a space in between them. It's just, they seem like two words for the purposes of like, if you're doing word count on your like word document to be like, how many words is is in here? It will count them separately because they have spaces. But, you know, a lot of things like greenhouse or chalkboard. Smartphone. Smartphone. You know, those started out with a space in between them, and then we gradually got rid of the space. And German just goes a little bit faster than us in getting rid of the space. There's also one that I'm sure you have an example from when you were perhaps growing up or when you moved to a different dialect area where someone essentially tries to shame you for using a form that isn't part of standard English or is kind of less used in standard English. And we've called this the ain't reaction. I think ain't is like the quintessential example of this because it's so present in so many varieties of English. And it's so shamed in all of them where it's present, and yet it's still there, and it's still, it's still alive and kicking in English. And people write letters to the editor about finding ink in dictionaries, like, rah, 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 this shouldn't be there, and, uh, it's because it's not real, and there's so much animus towards ain't. How many decades and centuries of people telling other people this isn't a real word has it been, and ain't is still going strong? It just makes me so happy. Yeah, good job, Ain't. Like, you're a fighter. <laughs> well, and Ain't starts out as a contraction of amnt, like am not, like is goes to isn't. But like, what does and am go to? I amped. Like, it isn't, but I amped. And that eventually turns into Ain't. And so that's why there's no, like, amped now, except I think there is in, like, a couple dialects, but not in most dialects. So Ain't takes on that function, but then once it stops sounding directly like amped, it's like, well, I could just expand and work for all of the different pronouns. So it's it's very versatile. It's super useful. And yet it's highly, highly stigmatized. And the way that that stigmatization is expressed is specifically in this not a real word. And I think it speaks to the fact that not a real word gets used as this really broad, unreflexive, unconsidered response to things that this is something that clearly is a word people use all the time. And that the only reaction you have is that's not a real word instead of that is a word that is considered informal and is probably best not used on this tombstone. (laughs) I'm sure someone's used it on a tombstone. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Like, I think there's a lot of nuance in that. And, like, this is one of the examples where that's not a real word gets used to shut down discussion and shut down, you know, argumentation. Especially you're like, oh, that's not a real word. Well, I looked it up. It's in the dictionary. And then you're like, well, that's a bad dictionary now because it had this not real word in it. It's one of those things of, like, you can't have an argument with somebody who won't at least acknowledge what would have to exist in order for them to be proven wrong. Yeah. You know, if you say, well, would you accept a dictionary as a source? And then you show it to them the word in Merriam-Webster or Oxford, like all the dictionaries have ain't. And then you show them there and they're like, well, I don't accept this as a source either. You're like, well, you just changed the goalposts now. Like, who who do you accept as the ultimate arbiter for what is or isn't a word? Or is anyone who makes the assertion that something isn't a word automatically the correct one? I just feel like if someone says to you that's not a word, 
it's really unfair that the burden of proof falls on you. So if I'm like, you know, here's a store that's there, and you're like, nope, not a real store, because it's not in the yellow pages yet. I'm like, but you can walk into it, it's a store that will sell you things. And you're like, nope. <laughs> no one's ever asked, like, oh, not a real word, well, define a real word. Like, what is a real word? I guess the challenge here is the easy response is to say, well, here's evidence that it is. But often when people are saying this, you know, there is something here that's about language policing and it's often cover for some kind of, you know, classism or racism or it's, you know, particularly picking on the language of a particular subgroup or it's covert for sexism. So there is like something here that's unpleasant and I wish people would stop doing. But even when I, even when I agree with them, it's also still an argument made in bad faith. Yeah. You know, like it's not, if someone says, well, you know, this isn't a word, even if I agree that like, you know, this was probably a typo that someone made, or, you know, this is something that maybe wasn't appropriate to a particular context, like legitimizing the argument that not a real word is a reasonable response to anything is still a problem, even if the core thing that they're getting at might have some utility in the context because it's so undefined and it's such an easy way of covering for, you know, classism and racism and all sorts of these kinds of discriminations that, that people smuggle into language. Yeah. The problem is the incorrect ideas about language works, not the particular words being used. Another type of word that people have the reaction it's not a word to is a word like smush or smush or arg. <laughs> so things that are more, uh, representative of kind of sounds or reactions or feelings um, that are often kind of informal or onomatopoeia. Yeah. And I think this begins to get into like, oh, it's not a word because my computer gave me a red underline when I tried to type it. And like, there are lots of different ways to try to spell arg. <laughs> and I definitely don't think computers generally have all of them. And that doesn't mean that a particular one isn't going to be the exact one you want right now. But thinking about those areas where we're trying to represent certain moods or certain feelings or certain onomatopoeias or certain other kinds of sounds that exist in nature or in the depths of our soul, like, ah, <laughs> these are hard to write adequately. And a lot of onomatopoeia in English is a bit uh, not standardized and people kind of play with it a lot. In other languages, it can be more codified into the language. And if you think about onomatopoeia in terms of like the sounds that animals make, we have lots of codified ways of doing that, you know, pigs oink and ducks quack, and that's very codified and you'll find quack in the dictionary and you'll probably find oink in the dictionary. But, you know, essentially language is very messy at the boundaries in the way that what is a word and isn't a word and you can't just be like, well, it's got a space. That gets a bit fuzzy at the boundaries. The same with this. So like smush might be more of a word than ah, uh, which is, you know, uh, perhaps not that easy to say. And, you know, ha ha is more of a word than like in terms of laughter. Yeah. But there's a certain kind of intentionality to them too, which I think distinguishes even something like arg, which can be spelled in a whole bunch of different ways from something like just kind of randomly mashing on your keyboard or like having your cat walk across your keyboard. Or actually screaming, which we won't do for the sake of your ears. <laughs> yeah, no screaming on this podcast. Uh, if you'd like to scream, please provide your own scream here. But there's a certain conventionalized way of representing those, and they have a, like, you have a, certain, have a certain recognizability to them and language-specific way of doing them, even if there's also this kind of flexibility around them as well. At the opposite end, moving back to things that kind of do fit within our expectation that they only have, you know, spaces on either side, they usually have relatively regularized spelling conventions, but people get very upset about them, is when brands make forays into word creation. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> and because I think one thing that upsets people about this a lot is when it doesn't feel forced, we don't think about it and we accept, you know, a squillion brand names into our lives and they just get absorbed and we're completely fine with it. And then there are times where it just feels very forced. And so it crashes. I, I have named this the trunk reaction <laughs> where people say that's not a word. Um, so Trunk was the Tribune publishing company, and quite a few years ago, they rebranded themselves to Trunk, T-R-O-N-C. Yeah, which is just... And they got kind of widely made fun of for it on social media as just like, 
why have you picked this name? It's so ugly. It's plonky. It's tronky. Uh, it's not a good name. And there is something about, you know, it doesn't have a particularly standardized English spelling. It's T-R-O-N-C. But it definitely fits. It's not like it's against the kind of sounds that you can put together in English. Yeah, and it definitely sounds a bit kind of, I don't know, like plonky. Like it's, it's, it's a bit clumsy sounding, but like we've incorporated so many weird words into English. Things like Xerox or Kleenex, which have a lot more X's than a normal English word does, or something like Google or Twitter, which sounded very frivolous when they were first introduced. And now we're just like, oh, yeah, of course, I'm going to Google it. And it doesn't seem weird to us because we're so used to them. And I think it's partly that we're very happy to accommodate new words when we need them. So Google sounded pretty silly when it started. And now we talk about Googling things to the point where if I'm trying to find something in a document, I'll sometimes be like, oh, I just have to Google for that word. It's like, I'm not even in the proprietary search engine, and it's just become the handy word. So if the language just needs that word, whereas I don't talk about binging anything. <laughs> that Yeah, and, like, uh, oh, I'm going to go Yahoo you know, it. I don't, I don't have any particularly strong feelings about either of these search engines. But one of them is definitely a lot more verby. One of them has definitely verbed into English a lot more happily. I even use like Skype to indicate for general video calls, even if I'm not actually using Skype's platform. Oh yeah, it doesn't matter what platform I'm using, it's still, that's become generic. It's like, hey Lauren, do you want to Skype? And then of course it's (laughs) going to be on Google Hangouts or something, it's not going to be on Skype. Which is problematic for companies, you know, when their brand gets used generically, it means that they lose some of the like brand copyright power. But I think it shows that language can be quite accommodating. I mean, English does love adding new words all the time, whether they come from a top-down company or not. Seems to be a bit arbitrary, but it's the thing about when we need them. Yeah. You know, Skype came around as the first video platform that I use. It's when we need them or when, like, it's something that people decide for themselves kind of bottom up and not having something forced down. Another one that I had a lot of fun with seeing people do on this was, so somebody replied to the Pope's Twitter account, where the Pope was talking about the Beatitudes, which is, it's a thing in the Bible. I don't know. (laughs) Uh, Being like, Beatitudes isn't a real word. And it's like, look, guys, like, this is the Pope. I probably can't tell you what a Beatitude is off the top of my head, but frankly, if the Pope is talking about them, he probably (laughs) thinks they're a real word. Yeah, yeah. Like, is this really the hill you want to die on right now? (laughs) Like, (laughs) tweeting at the Pope being like, this obscure bit of, like, theological terminology, which you have spent your entire life studying, is not a real word. I also found somebody saying that gubernatorial is not a real word, and I agree, this word looks weird. I kind of almost feel compelled to agree. Um, There is some, like, story here where, like, governor and gubernatorial came into English through slightly different – there's always the, like, French from Latin pubs. Okay. And, like, one of them came in via Latin, via French, and one of them, like, snuck in straight via French or something, and that's why gubernatorial is – it should just be governatorial yeah. if we're going to have a regularized system. But English, like any language, can handle quite a bit of irregularity in the vocabulary. Yeah, and you get the impression that people who are using arguments like this, you know, they're not really saying to the Pope, like, I don't trust your command of the English language, especially like the Pope's social media officer, who probably isn't even the actual Pope. What they're saying is, this is an argument that I can make that, like we were talking about at the beginning, like, you can use this as an argument even if you don't believe it, because it immediately shifts the burden of proof to the other person to say, no, well, this is a word and here's why, and not to you for being like, well, why don't you think so? It kind of reminds me of a subset of this, which I like to think of as the mansplain reaction, (laughs) which is where you say something's not a real word because it conflicts with your worldview, essentially. I really like an example of this that I found, which was somebody saying that conspiracy theory is not a real word. Oh, and they say- okay. <laughs> I know. Why is conspiracy theory not a real word? Is it because it has a space in it, Gretchen? We've been through this one. <laughs> no, it's somebody said it's a made-up mind control word that causes one to dismiss the facts without any investigation. I was like, whoa, okay. This is a pretty prototypical example of a mansplain reaction. (laughs) Yeah, so it's like, I don't like the concept expressed by this word, so I'm going to attack the word and not the concept, or say, like, it was unnecessary to name this concept because I don't think the concept is important, or I don't think the concept exists. There's no such thing as mansplaining. We're just having a conversation in which I am aggressively disagreeing at you. (laughs) 
<laughs> right. I think the big problem that I have with not a real word argument is it implies that there are some sorts of words that aren't real. But by the time something exists for you to say it's a kind of word, that's all it takes to be a real word. And words are words by consensus. Like, no word is a real word. Every word has to start off by a group of people agreeing that this string of sounds has this particular meaning. And, you know, some people in some contexts have more authority in naming these things. You know, I'll probably trust a doctor in telling me whether a word means a particular thing in terms of medical usage. I will definitely trust someone to tell me what their name is rather than trusting myself. Yeah, like I think there are certain kinds of authorities. A person is the ultimate authority on what their own name is. And by that logic, linguists should be the ultimate authorities on whether words are real or not. And what we're telling you is all the words are real. For more Lingthusiasm and links to all the things mentioned in this episode, go to lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Google Podcasts, or Google Play Music, SoundCloud, or wherever else you get your podcasts. And you can follow at Lingthusiasm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr. You can get IPA scarves, IPA ties, and other Lingthusiasm merch at lingthusiasm.com slash merch. I can be found as at Gretchen A. McSee on Twitter, and my blog is allthingslinguistic.com. I tweet and blog as Superlinguo. To listen to bonus episodes, ask us your linguistics questions, and help keep the show ad-free, go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm or follow the links from our website. Recent bonus topics include hyperforeignisms, multilingual babies, homonyms, and an inside view of the gesture and emoji conferences, and you can help us pick the next topic by becoming a patron. If you can't afford to pledge, that's okay too. We also really appreciate it if you can rate us on iTunes or recommend Lingthusiasm to anyone who needs a little more linguistics in their life especially this month when we're doing our special anniversary round of recommending to help the show grow. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gaughan. Our audio producer is Claire Gaughan. Our editorial producers are Emily Graff and A.E. Prevost. Our production assistants are Celine Yoon and Fabian Annenberg. And our music is by The Triangles. Stay Lingthusiastic! Lingthusiastic!